speaker, who is Professor Amir Yacobi from Harvard, and he's going to talk about mercury cadmium telluride quantum wells and the interplay of superconductivity and spin orbit coupling. Right, so I'd like to start by thanking the organizers for uh, inviting me, giving the opportunity to uh, tell you a little bit about the work that has been done on two-dimensional topological insulators. Uh, the, the focus of this talk would be on one particular material system uh, composed of mercury, cadmium, and telluride quantum wells. As you'll see, these are two-dimensional topological insulators, and they hold a lot of interest both from their fa fundamental standpoint in terms of uh, exhibiting quantum spin hall physics and also in terms of uh, prospects of exploring uh, Majorana modes and Majorana bound states. So in this talk, I'll cover some background on this material system to give you a sense why is it a topological insulator and where uh, and how uh, um, one constructs these type of systems. Uh, I'll give some uh, experimental evidence for the quantum spin hall effect, both the pioneering work of Mollenkamp on this system as well as some of our own data. Uh, but of course, transport measurements are not a uh, very direct way of determining that current is confined to the boundaries of the sample, which is what we expect for a topological insulator. So I'll then introduce a different method, the method that we've started working on approximately a year ago that's very suitable for two-dimensional systems in particular, uh, in order to see the crossover from uniform flow inside the topological insulator when the chemical potential is in the conduction band to edge transport when the system enters into the topological gap. Uh, this will probably cover most of the first talk. Uh, the second talk on Friday, I will discuss the effects of a magnetic field, an in-plane magnetic field. And I'll show that in these systems, the interplay of spin orbit, Zeeman and spin orbit, uh, with superconductivity leads to superconductivity or pairing, induced pairing inside the semiconductor that has finite momentum. Uh, and we'll, sh we'll see that that actually leads to uh, disappearance and reappearance of superconductivity as a function of magnetic field something that has been explored in various systems prior, uh, for example, superconducting ferromagnetic, superconducting junctions, only here the system is very tunable uh, and we can see the effects of the various orientation of magnetic field on this phenomenon. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge the contribution of Sean Hart and Hetchen Ren who've uh, basically done these experiments and we've benefited from a lot of uh, discussions with Bert, Bert Halperin uh, on the physics of what's going on here. So just as a general background, the quantum spin hall effect, of course, is a, is a situation where uh, electrons are in general confined to move in, in a quantum well, in a plane, and when the Fermi energy is tuned to the gap, one ends up with what's called helical states. These consist of uh, two one-dimensional edge modes counter-propagating with respect to one another, each carrying opposite spin. Uh, and uh, this is actually the pioneering ideas uh, where a lot of the work on topological insulators began. Uh, and, of course, there's a lot of interest in coupling these helical states to superconductivity because that will then lead to these Majorana modes, topological superconductivity, and localized Majorana states. So I'd like to begin by giving you some general background uh, on how and why is mercury cadmium telluride an interesting system to explore. So we're all familiar with the Dirac equation, we're also familiar with the Schrodinger equation, and of course, going from the Dirac equation to the Schrodinger equation, there are approximations that are made, and usually we're familiar with the spin-orbit interaction, uh, in addition to the uh, just plain old Schrodinger equation, uh, as some leftover of the relativistic quantum mechanics. But it turns out that there are other terms that one needs to pay attention, in particular in this mater material system, in order to understand why is it that it uh, becomes a topological insulator. So what I plot here is the energy bands of the p orbitals and s orbitals of cadmium telluride. Uh, 
And uh, this is what you would get if you were just to compute the Schrodinger t term. And then I'm just showing how the various relativistic terms coming from the Dirac equation alter the band separation. So you can think of these orbitals as forming the band bottom of the conduction band. And you see that that's an S orbital, S band, and the top of the valence band, which is a P orbital band. And you see that this Darwin term shifts, increases the band gap a little bit, and the mass term here reduces the band gap. And I'll talk about spin orbit in just a bit. But the interesting thing is that when you look at mercury tellurite, something very peculiar happens. And that is that this mass term renormalizes the energy gap between these two, uh, between these two bands drastically, nearly closing the gap entirely. And the reason this is important is that spin orbit eventually is playing an important role in inverting the bands, getting uh, actually the p orbitals sitting higher at higher energies than the s orbitals. But in order to achieve that, uh, you wouldn't be able to get that with a bare band gap that you would expect just from the Schrodinger non-relativistic terms. So how does the spin orbit uh, work? We're, of course, looking at a term that has a dot product of some orbital momentum and uh, spin angular momentum. The uh, two bands that I were describing before was an S orbital band consisting of orbital angular momentum zero and a spin one half. And of course, the P orbital has orbital angular momentum of one and is six fold degenerate, therefore. If we want to get a sense of what is the spin orbit term does to these two bands, we could just look at the expectation of L dot S. And it's easy to see that that expectation is just uh, the difference between uh, j squared, which is s plus l squared, minus l squared minus s squared. And now given that e all these quantum numbers are known for these two bands, one can easily see what one expects for the magnitude of the spin orbit splitting for the two bands. So first of all, if one looks at the conduction band, the s orbitals that have l equals zero, then j and s both equals one half, and so there is no change in energy due to the spin orbit interaction. But for the uh, valence band, the p orbitals, where the uh, angular momentum is one, j is three halves, l is one, and s is one half, then there is a correction. And one can see that that correction splits the valence band into two terms that depends on uh, basically whether the total angular momentum j is three halves or one half. And so, that's the effect of spin orbit interaction. You see that the six-fold degeneracy breaks up into a four-fold degeneracy. These are usually the holes uh, in many semiconductors. And then this bottom band is called a split-off band and is very often disregarded. Uh, it's very far from the conduction band. So this is the situation in mercury in cadmium telluride where this energy gap is large. And I already want to point out that this four-fold degeneracy is only true at k equals zero. Once you go to finite momentum, then the projection of the angular momentum on the z-axis matters. And there is basically a light band consisting of uh, projection angular momentum j sub z plus minus a half and a heavy band, a heavy hole band, which is the plus minus three halves. This will be important when we discuss the g-factor of these different bands. So this was the effect on cadmium telluride, uh, the spin orbit uh, splits the valence band and leaves the conduction band unchanged. But you see, given that the energy splitting between the S band and the P band is to begin with large, this splitting is not doing anything fundamental to the band structure. However, in mercury telluride, now once we include the spin orbit, you see that now uh, this spin orbit interaction is larger than the leftover band gap between the P and S orbitals. And that leads to the inversion of the p orbitals uh, versus s orbitals uh, in mercury telluride. And we have a funny situation where the p orbitals lie above the s orbitals. And that's the fundamental reason for why mercury cadmium telluride or this system would have, uh, would, would be a topological insulator. So here again, looking at the two band structures, you see the difference between cadmium telluride, which in this system is just used as a barrier material to confine the electrons to move in the plane. And then the electrons really reside in this thin quantum well of mercury telluride. And you can ask, why is it that we're making a quantum well? And the reason is that mercury telluride, in fact, is not an insulator at all. It's a semi-metal. You see that uh, 
if you position your Fermi energy at any place here, it always cuts some states. And the reason is that uh, this conduction band here made of p orbitals uh, has one of the bands dispersing upwards, the light hole band, and the heavy hole band is dispersing downwards. So if we want to actually make this into an insulator, uh, the way to do it is to introduce some energy uh, gap due to confinement. So imagine we construct a quantum well, which is very, very narrow. So now we sandwich, we grow a material that consists of mercury telluride sandwiched between two barrier material, cadmium telluride. In the cadmium telluride, you see that indeed the blue or the S orbitals sit above. This is the bottom of the conduction band, top of the valence band. And if the well is very narrow, then the fact that these bands were inverted will not matter so much because as we compress things very tightly in space, the zero point energy associated with the confinement will push the electron states up in energy and the whole like states down in energy and will restore the original band alignment. So this becomes a normal insulator where the electron states sit above the whole like states. But as you widen the quantum well, you make it wider and wider, at some point you're going to reach a situation where they invert and this is the interesting condition and that happens roughly when the width of this quantum well is approximately 6.3 nanometers. And so depending on the width for uh, quantum wells of width le less than 6.3 nanometers, uh, the electron states sit above the whole like states and this is a normal insulator so you see that all the states here are basically blue, namely they're composed of s orbitals, they're electron-like in the conduction band and they're whole like in the valence band. Uh, at a critical dimension, 6.3 nanometers, the gap closes precisely and you get really single Dirac cone. And then for any dimension larger than 6.3 nanometers, the system uh, has this inverted band structure. Where now, if, you can, if the colors are good enough, you can see that at the bottom of the band, actually you have red-like states. So the actual electronic states that compose the conduction band have P symmetry. They have a different symmetry than before, and in fact, the valence band is now composed of electron-like states, so the bands have been inverted. And once the bands have inverted, we have in the boundaries of this sample uh, uh, topological protected edge states, and given that the system is two-dimensional, these edge states are one-dimensional, and these are these helical edge states that I mentioned in the introduction. So now let's ask how would one go about exploring the presence of these uh, helical edge states. So the simplest thing to imagine is to start with one of these quantum wells and assume the Fermi energy is sitting somewhere in the conduction band. Uh, so we have just uniform electron flow between two metallic contacts. But as we turn, tune down the density, and we could do that by depositing a metal gate on top of the, of the structure and just capacitively removing charge from the system, that allows us to tune the chemical potential. And we can then position it at a place where it's sitting inside the gap. And when it's sitting inside the gap, transport will no longer proceed through the bulk. But if these helical edge states were there, then we'll get some leftover conductance even as the Fermi energy is placed inside the gap. And these were indeed the original experiments that were done, and I'll review some of them in just a bit. Of course, if we're interested in some of the more interesting properties of the helical edge states, for example, to induce a topological superconductor or Majorana modes or localized Majorana states, uh, one would like to replace the metallic contacts with superconducting contacts. This leads to gapping out of these helical states due to superconductivity, due to pairing. Of course, if one would like to uh, localize Majorana states, one would need to gap this helical states by yet another mechanism separate from superconductivity. And here one can envision uh, a magnetic field that breaks time reversal symmetry and therefore leads to backscattering along this helical edge. And at the boundary between these two gapping mechanisms between superconductivity and this time reversal symmetry breaking, one would expect to see localized Majorana states. And of course this was work that uh, was done by Charlie Kane, Lian Fu, uh, uh, and, and really basically set the stage for this kind of physics. All right, so let me just 
describe a little bit now what one would expect uh, in terms of transport uh, when the system is indeed inside the gap region and there are only uh, these helical edge states present. So in that case, we can imagine a hall bar that consists in this particular case six contacts. Uh, and we're going to send current from one contact. We impose a chemical potential mu. The other side here is at chemical potential zero. And what we have is a gapped system in the bulk, and we only have these helical states residing at the boundary, uh, where we have one type of spin going forward, the other type of spin going backward. These measurements are not sensitive to spin, so to some extent one can think of these as just one-dimensional conductors that are connecting between any pair of uh, metallic contacts. And so one can go through a very simple exercise of seeing what kind of conductance one would expect if we impose a current I. So we can look at this voltage probe here. The condition for a voltage probe is one where there's no net current uh, flowing into it. And so the amount of current that is coming out of this contact is two times, is th there are two edge modes going out of this contact at mu1. There's the red one going in this direction and there's the blue one going in this direction. Each one is carrying a current which is mu1 times the unit of conductance that has been canceled out in this equation. So overall the amount of current going out is just twice mu1. The amount of current going in, we have one edge mode of chemical potential mu going in and another chemical potential mu2 going in from this contact here. So current conservation for this contact simply states that twice mu1 is equal to mu plus mu2. Similarly, we can go through this calculation or requirement of current conservation at uh, contact number two. In this case, we have one here, chemical potential zero, so we replace mu, which was here, with zero, and we get two mu2 equals mu1. And it's easy to solve this for a given chemical potential mu, to find that mu1 equals two-thirds mu and mu2 equals one-third mu. Essentially, the way voltage drops in this device, in this particular configuration, is one-third, one-third, and another one-third. The net current is just the amount of current injected minus, again, the amount of current going in. So again, the same uh, the same trick allows us to write what the net current is, is 2 times mu minus mu1. And here I did include the unit of conductance, E squared over H, which is the uh, conductance of one, of one one-dimensional conductor. And so the net current is 2 thirds times mu times E squared over H. And so if we now ask what is the conductance that we will infer by measuring this voltage difference and dividing it by the total current, uh, it's easy to see that we're going to find that this is 2 e squared over h. And the reason it's 2, even though there is conductances of 1 e squared over h connecting any two contacts, is simply that the current is divided. And here we've assumed that it's divided symmetrically between the upper channel and the lower channel. Now, there is, of course, a very easy way to envision exactly what one would expect in this kind of circuit for any type of uh, number of contacts, and that is to really physically replace each one of these conductors with one of these unit of conductors, uh, quantum conductance. And then one can easily see in this kind of resistive network that indeed the voltage across here would generate a conductance, the ratio of this voltage to the total current of 2e squared over h. Uh, and what I'd like to answer experimentally is to what extent uh, each one of these edges really is quantized at a value of e squared over h. And we'll see that the actual experiments are not, uh, are not exactly consistent with that. They're definitely indicative of that, but there's big deviations. So these are the pioneering experiments uh, from Mullenkamp's group uh, where they've looked at a hall bar They've made contacts that are separated by a distance of a few microns. Uh, and in order to be in the regime where they could see something that's close to the quantized value, this distance had to be of order one micron. Uh, and they've looked at different type of systems. First of all, they've looked at a quantum well for which the width of the well was below the critical dimension, namely it's, normal, it's a normal insulator. It's not a topological insulator. And what they found is that as you go from uh, 
a chemical potential in the valence band through the gap to the conduction band, you see that when the system was in the gap, the resistance was very, very large. It was definitely not 2e squared over h, and that's consistent with having 